Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to go through an example showing you why when you turn on the afterburner in a jet engine, the nozzle area opens up wider. This is a really rough schematic of the back of the engine, so we're just looking at the afterburner jet pipe and then the nozzle for both the case when we have no afterburner and when we do have an afterburner. And you can see when we don't have an afterburner, whatever's coming out of the turbine is just going straight through the jet pipe here, or the afterburner pipe, without having any extra fuel in there or ignited, and then it goes out this nozzle of converging area. And then here we have the flow coming out of the turbine and we inject more fuel, ignite it, and now we have these red squiggly flames here. And then we have uh, the nozzle again, but in this case the area, the exit area of the nozzle has to increase an in area farther than what it is for when you don't have an afterburner. Now if you have an afterburner on your jet engine, you most likely have a converging diverging nozzle in the sense that the nozzle will decrease to a throat area and then increase again so you can get the maximum amount of thrust. But the same physics applies to just converging nozzles and they're easier to talk about. So I'm I'm going to go through a converging nozzle example to show you why and you can apply that to a converging diverging nozzle. So let's quickly go through some of the givens in the problem. It's a long list but don't let that uh, intimidate you here. Uh, so we're talking about a converging nozzle as I mentioned on the previous board. This nozzle is operating isentropically which means that there's no losses due to fri uh, friction etc. Uh, the afterburner is optional so we can either have it off or on. Even though we have uh, combustion products coming out of the or going into the nozzle I'm assuming that we're talking about air because this is just an example and it'll work out the same way. And the specific gas constant of air is 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin. The specific heat ratio of air is 1.4. We're assuming that this engine is operating either on the ground at sea level or on a test stand at sea level so that the exit pressure that the engine is exhausting into is 101.325 pascals. The stagnation pressure at the inlet of the nozzle is 192 kilopascals, and that's for both afterburner on and afterburner off. I'll talk about that in a second. The stagnation temperature at the inlet of the nozzle is 900 Kelvin when there's no afterburner, and the stagnation temperature of the, when the afterburner is on is 1600 Kelvin. And then the area, exit area of the nozzle is 0.17 meters squared when we do not have the afterburner on. I'm also assuming that the mass flow rate of the fuel that's going into the afterburner is negligible, so it's not going to increase the mass that we have going through, and that we're talking about a calorically perfect gas, uh, which is abbreviated as CPG. Now you'll note that there are only two differences between the non-afterburning and the afterburning engines. The first is the changing exit area, and that's what we're trying to solve for, and the reason that the exit area changes is because of this change in stagnation temperature. So the prime consequence of an afterburner burner is that you're going to increase the stagnation enthalpy of the flow going into the nozzle. And if you have a calorically perfect gas for which the specific heats are constant, that means that you have an increase in the stagnation temperature. So you can see the stagnation, stagnation temperature for no afterburning coming out of the turbine is 900 Kelvin. And now we have this afterburner, we turn it on and we have a stagnation temperature increase at the inlet of the nozzle and now it's at 1600 Kelvin. So the way that we're going to solve this problem is that we're going to have a two-step process. The first is to find the mass flow rate without the afterburner. It's going to be called M dot and it has units of kilograms per second, so mass per unit time, mass flow rate. And then the second step is to find that area with the afterburner on that's needed to keep that same mass flow rate. So the reason that we want to keep the mass flow rate the same is because we don't want to alter anything upstream of this afterburner when we turn the afterburner on. We don't want the, the components upstream in the engine to know that we've turned the afterburner on. That's another reason why the stagnation pressure stays the same for both of these because in a similar way when we say that the mass flow rate stays the same, same, the stagnation pressure uh, has to stay the same in order to not affect the flow upstream of this afterburner. If you have a changing uh, mass flow rate or ch uh, changing stagnation pressure, something that could happen is a compressor surge, which is obviously very bad. So here are those simplified schematics just drawn over again uh, with some of these variables included here. So this is for the non-afterburning case where we have it converging to a, a nice small throat here, and we have the stagnation temp or a stagnation pressure at the inlet of the nozzle and a stagnation temperature at the inlet of the nozzle. And you can see that it is expanding to an exit pressure of PE and the exit area is AE. Now for the afterburner on, you can see that the area has opened up. We still have the same stagnation pressure, but we have a higher stagnation temperature for the afterburner and the exit area is AEAB, still exhausting to the atmospheric pressure PE. So before we get into the math, I want to quickly go over a concept called choked flow. So here we have our nozzle, converging nozzle. We have a stagnation pressure here and an exit pressure here, and we have some mass flow rate going through the nozzle. Over here, I have a plot of the mass flow rate through the nozzle versus the ratio of the exit pressure over the stagnation pressure. And so, if I take this nozzle, this is my 3D printed nozzle that I have, it looks kind of like this, and I say, well, I'm just holding it here 
you don't imagine there's any mass flow rate through this thing because it's just sitting here. And that's because the P naught and the P here and here are equal. And if this ratio, if these two are equal, it equals one. And you can see in our plot that we have at one, no mass flow rate, that makes sense. Now, if I increase the stagnation pressure by blowing into this side, so we have mass flow rate going through, and that happened because I increased P naught, which decreased this ratio, so this moved it back on this line. You can see that we have an increasing mass flow rate through this nozzle. That only happens up to a certain point, which we call the uh, choked point, or the point at which the nozzle is choked. And if you pull this ratio down farther past this point, you will not get any higher mass flow rate through your, through your nozzle. So for a certain geometry of your nozzle, there is only so much mass flow rate that can go through that nozzle. So why do we care about the choked state? Well, if you look at this plot here, you can see that when the flow is choked, so from here back to here, the mass flow rate, m dot, is equal to a constant. And what happens when your flow is choked is in a converging nozzle, you will get sonic flow right at the nozzle throat at the smallest area. So that means that your Mach number is equal to one. In a converging nozzle, you will never get supersonic flow. You'll get subsonic flow up until Mach number is equal to one at the throat here. And when that happens, we can define a convenient reference state uh, called the star state, where Mach number is defined as one, and then we can define density as rho star, the velocity as u star, the area as a star. And then what we can do is solve for the mass flow rate using these star quantities. So what happens if your nozzle is not choked? Well, then you can't use the star state anymore to compute the actual mass flow rate through the engine because the star state ends up being just a fictitious reference state in your nozzle, not the actual what's happening at the throat. So this m dot equation here would no longer hold for a nozzle that's not choked. Now, another question is why do we even want a choked nozzle in the first place? Well, if you look at my turbojet thrust equation derivation, you'll note that the uh, major component of the thrust is the exit velocity of the just coming out of the engine, and to increase the velocity coming out of the engine the most, you wanna have choke flow, at least in a converging nozzle, but in a normal afterburning engine, you use a converging diverging nozzle to get that extra velocity. Uh, but in this case, again, it's just for this particular example, it's a converging nozzle. You wanna have choke flow to get the maximum thrust out of your engine. So the first step is to find out if the nozzle's choked, and to do this, we're first gonna use the exit pressure over the chamber pressure, stagnation pressure, and that's 101.325 kilopascals over 192 kilopascals, and that gives us a ratio of 0.5 277. Now we're going to use the stagnation relation to get P star over P naught, and then we can compare that to PE over P naught that we calculated here. And if this value here, PE over P naught, is less than P star over P naught, that means that the flow is choked because the engine is trying to run to expand the flow out to the exit pressure, but if it physically can't because P star is the definition of the choked state, then the flow has to be choked. Now this is the stagnation to static relationship for pressure, uh, and I have a video deriving this equation if you want to see more. And this equation, you can relate the stagnation to static conditions at any point in the flow, regardless of whether your flow is isentropic. So at this point, this is point one in our nozzle, you can say P naught one over P one, you can find that value. Uh, for two, you can say P naught two over P two, which I forgot here. And the thing is that we have made the assumption that the nozzle is isentropic, which means that we can relate two to one in this equation. And that means that we can relate the star state, which will be at the throat, and the stagnation state, which is up here. So for P star, we said by definition, the Mach number at the throat is gonna equal one because the, the flow is choked. So if I just substitute in P star for the P here, and M is equal to one into here, we can simplify this equation down. It becomes only a function of the specific heat ratio. So we have one plus 0.4 over two, to the 3.5 is equal to 1.893. And recall, we needed P star over P naught, so we're just gonna flip this and we get the P star over P naught is equal to 0 0.5283. And if I multiply both sides by the uh, stagnation pressure value, we get P star is equal to 101.43 kilopascals. We're gonna use this a little bit later. But what we need to compare now is this P star over P naught ratio to the PE over P naught ratio that we calculated before. So if we compare the values of our PE over P naught, we see that it is in fact less than P star over P naught, which means that our flow is indeed choked. Now this means from that other whiteboard that we can express the mass flow rate using those star quantities. So this is the mass flow rate is equal to rho star, u star, a star, density, velocity, area. 
the area we have because we have the throat area for a non-afterburning engine, uh, but we need rho star and u star. So rho star we're going to get from the ideal gas law. We said this was a calorically perfect gas, which is a perfect gas. So we can say that rho star is equal to the pressure star over specific gas constant times T star. We also need u star. So if we look at the definition of the Mach number, we have that it is the, the local velocity over the local speed of sound, which is equal to one because this is by definition the star quantity Mach number is equal to one. So if we rearrange this, we get that the u star is equal to the uh, speed of sound star, which is given by gamma r t star. And I have a video uh, going through the derivation of this equation right here. So you can see that from these equations, we need to know p star, which we have from the previous whiteboard. We know r. We need to know or we need to find T star in order to calculate U star and rho star to be able to plug into here with our throat area to find the mass flow rate. So next we'll do that. So let's compute those values. The first thing we're gonna do is start off with our stagnation to static isentropic relation here, again derived in another video, but this time it's for temperature. I've already plugged in the T star for our static temperature and plugged in the Mach number is equal to one by definition. So we have that T star after rearranging, move this to that side, divide by this. We get 900 Kelvin, that's the stagnation temperature divided by one plus 0.4 divided by two, and we get our T star to be 750 Kelvin. That is the temperature at the throat of our nozzle. Then we can plug that in to find our rho star because we know that our P star was 101,430 Pascals. This has to be in Pascals when you use it in this equation, so make sure to convert that from kilopascals. And then we have over the specific gas constant of air times T star to give us a density star of 0.4712 kilograms per meter, uh, per meter cubed. And then we can find U star by plugging the T star into here, in here, taking the square root, and we get U star. The velocity coming out at the throat is 549 meters per second. Now, while we're at it, I'm gonna compute the afterburner uh, star values as well, since we have all the stuff we need for it. So, in the same way that I did the other one, we're gonna use that stagnation to static, isentropic relation. Uh, but now for the afterburner, T star AB, we're using that 1600 Kelvin instead of 900 Kelvin, but the denominator stays the same. So we get T star now is 1333 Kelvin. Plug that into the rho star afterburner equation. This stays the same, it's still the P star and then we have R stays the same and now it's just the temperature. This staying the same is just an assumption. This would change uh, based off of the changing temperatures and conditions in the afterburner, but we're making that assumption here. So we plug in that 1333 Kelvin here and we get rho star AB is 0 0.265 kilograms per meter cubed. And then we can plug the temperature star in here to get the velocity and we get, plugging it into here, that the U star from the afterburner is 732 meters per second. You can see that this is an increase in the exit velocity, which is what we uh, were hoping for from the, our afterburners that we want to increase thrust, so we want to increase the exit velocity. Uh, and the other thing that you might note here is that our density here is lower than what it was before. And that's just another something that's just showing you how all these things are intertwined, how we're adding in or we're increasing the stagnation enthalpy, which you can say is increasing the stagnation temperature, which then affects the density of the gases. So everything's kind of intertwined. Last thing we need is the A star value for our mass flow rate equation. And because the flow is choked, A star is equal to the exit area the actual exit area, which is 0.17 meters squared, this would not be the case if the flow was not choked. Now that we have all the things we need, all the variables, we can solve for the mass flow rate. M dot is equal to rho star, u star, a star. Plug in the values from two whiteboards ago with the non-afterburning values, and we get a mass flow rate through this nozzle of 44 kilograms per second. For afterburner operation now, we know that we want to keep the mass flow rate the same, so M dot AB is equal to M dot is equal to 44 kilograms per second. And we have the same equation here because the flow is still choked, so we have the M dot afterburner is equal to rho star afterburner, u star afterburner, a e star afterburner. And we're gonna solve for that exit area because that's what we don't know. And for choke flow, we know that the a e afterburner star is equal to a e afterburner. So we're solving for a, we're just gonna divide both sides by this. And we have M dot over rho star a b times u star a b. And when we solve for the exit area, we get 0.227 meters squared. And you'll note that that area, exit area, is greater than the exit area for no afterburner, which is 0.17 meters squared. So that was the example showing you why you have to open up your nozzle exit area if you turn on your afterburner. Thanks for watching.